Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is uh, going to talk about coming face to face with the risk of artificial intelligence. Let me start with a very long paragraph. This lady is amazing. Head of Group of Model Validation at Maybank. Uh, she's mainly in charge of model validation for models within the group and setting up model risk management framework, which includes governance and policies. The rest, I'll let her tell you. Ladies and gentlemen, Maybank's Head Group Model Validation, Madame Zihan Ismail. Yesterday, you know, there were a lot of interesting topics being presented by various uh, presenters and I myself have to say that I learned a lot from yesterday and I'm happy to be here. So hopefully today I will be sharing with you based on my experiences in the area of modeling, artif artificial intelligence as well as machine learning. Um, as mentioned by Serena just now, I am actually in charge of model governance model and model risk management for Maybank Group. You all know Maybank, right? Malaysia's biggest domestic bank and number four in Asian countries. Okay, something to be very proud of. And um, my experiences in modeling actually started way back in year 2000. Any one of you not born yet then? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, because Actually, banks has been using models for the longest time. Okay, um, let me see if this works. Initially, we were looking at traditional models because banks are using models in terms of running the business. Mainly, you know, for instance, one of the biggest uh, area that banks are involved in are actually lending, right? So you give out loans, it's not that difficult to, is to give out loans, as you may imagine. But getting the money back, that is what is called credit risk. Whether you are giving loans to the correct people, whether they will be paying you back, right? Uh, because banks are banks, we are reputable organizations. We are not alums. <laughs> if people don't pay us, what can banks do? Can we go splash out red paint? Cannot, right? <laughs> Can we go and harass the family members? No, we don't do that. We can call them, we can persuade them to actually pay and all that. So, um, you know, very nice way. But again, if people don't pay, there's, um, you know, that, that's a huge risk to the bank. So we need to make sure that uh, credit risk is taken care of. And we are using models for that. We have been using models since the longest time to make sure that we give out, to, the, uh, to give out loans to the correct people, to, it's also in the area of market risk to see that we make the correct bets and also in operational risk side. Okay, so briefly, what actually is a model? Okay, there are three components in the models. So let's see here. I mean, this is a definition from Federal Reserve System and from the US. What model did it, what is model defined? It refers to quantitative method, system or approach that applies statistical, economic, financial or mathematical theories techniques and assumptions to process the input data into quantitative estimates. So let me just boil down to three points. There are three important components of a model. First one is the input. Input are the data, right? What comes in. The middle part, that is very important. The processing part. How do you actually process those information so it come out into the correct input? Sorry, the correct output. Output is actually the, um, the reports or the what so-called models we are used by the um, by the business users or anybody else who is uh, who are relying on those. The important part is the equally is the middle part, the processing. It can be a formula, it can be a set of algorithm, it can be uh, assumptions, it can be judgmentally based as well. So that is what model is all about and. As I mentioned just now, traditionally we have been using models for a long time, um, but we normally use what we call things like um, regression models, which are manually or most of it is done um, 
by human. But in the past few years, we see an explosion of artificial intelligence and machine learning models. And I think that's why most of you here um, today, right? Because I can tell you, when I first started the, you know, doing the modeling, um, we are a group of what we call, we call ourselves then, not data scientists, but quants. Quants stand for quantitative analysts, right? Quantitative experts. And we are like a group of, a small group of people. Not many people understand what we do, but they want the model that comes out of us. So we are a group of small but very high impact individuals. Now, data scientists, big data and all that is on everybody's mind. And you know, that, I think that's why you are here to find more about it. Okay, so let me move on from there. Okay, all this machine learning, AI models, drones, uh, self-driving cars, uh, models to predict, you know, something like what you wanted is a crystal ball to see if I give up, for the, from the bank's point of view, if we got, give out the loan to this person, is it going to pay me back or not and all that. Everybody's looking for that and it's all very exciting because you have a lot more data now and you have more uh, processing power. But again, as more and more models, as AI is being applied more and more into our, the areas of our lives, I just want to share with you that we have to be very careful of it because I have seen the other side of it, personally experience it or what I'm going to share you later in terms of really big, big disasters that come up of this if you don't control the models, if you don't control the AI. Okay, I'm sure that you know you have seen some of the movies on that, but let me share you the, the real life experiences, what have happened in, um, you know, in the, most of what I'm sharing is most to do with the financial world because that's where I came from. So make sure that you control the model and not let the model control you. Okay. Anybody heard of this? Knight Capital. This is a U in US. US largest brokerage lost 440 million. How long does it take for them to lose that 440 million? Not ringgit, you know, US dollar. 20 minutes. It's a US largest trader and it went out of business in 20 minutes in the year 2012. Today, if you Google up, there is no night capital because it's been acquired by another company. This happened in August 2012. The merger, the takeover happened in December. That's how quickly it went under. So, can you imagine what happened? You clock in in the morning at 9 o'clock. You know what happened at you come in at 9 o'clock, right? What you do first when you come in, turn on computer, start working. Perhaps some of you do. But perhaps most of us do is go to the pantry and make some coffee, right? 20 minutes, hot steaming coffee or tea, go sit at your desk. What happened? Your colleague come and tell you, eh, balik lah. Balik lah, there's, there's no company, this company doesn't exist anymore. This is what happened. And you know why this happened? It's a trading company, it's a brokerage, and they have this automated trading, right? Where you key in the, you know, where if the price goes up and down, it, can, it just says automatically, it says, sends the um, buy or sell orders. What happened is a technician, there were some changes they made to the system and the technician forgot to, forgot to copy and paste a one line of coding. Okay, that's what happened. 20 minutes, all gone, balik rumah, pergi shopping. <laughs> okay, so th this is how serious it is. Okay, this one is also from the US because I think they are using a lot more models and then, you know, um, this is, a, but this is a lesson that we can learn. This is another one, Trans America. Trans America is a holding company of various insurance companies, right? So, this is, okay, this is a point to, right? I, oh, sorry. most of my slides here because of the <laughs> <laughs> Okay, how do I do this? Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. Okay, so, 
quickly, quickly. Quickly, boys. Ayah. Oh, okay. Back where you're supposed to be. Okay, back here. Okay, forget, forget about what you see. Just not pretend you didn't see it. Eh? Erase it from your mind. If I have, you know, some AI, you know, oh, it's man in black, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I can just flash this and you all remember what you have seen just now. But anyway, this is Trans. This is um. This is Trans America. Um, it's an insurance group of companies. This is against failure for the model um, because it, it got fined for. Uh, no, they have to pay back the investors 97 million. Again, this is because of the model. If you see from here, the one that I actually um, uh, highlighted in, in, the, in the red box, this is because they found out the models which were developed solely by an inexperienced junior analysis. Analysts contained numerous errors and did not work as promised. Okay, again, this is a failure at certain level, there is no control, you just get somebody junior to do the, develop the model, no check and balance. I'm going to talk more about the check, how do you do the check and balance after this in one of my slides later. Okay, so again, need to have check and balance. Just somebody junior, um, develop the model, nobody check, and it cost the company 97 million, again, US dollar. Oh, okay. Um, this is a more well-known case. JP Morgan, um, London Well. Anybody heard of this? I think those of you in finance industries um, must be aware of this. Again, this is because of the market risk model used to calculate VAR. Okay, to, um, this is again, this is more like manipulation of the model and the misuse of the model because they, they are actually using models to trade. And you know, when you trade, the higher the risk, um, the higher the return, and it's when it becomes so risky, then it's like gambling already. And what happened here, if you see from the graph, you know how the portfolio actually increases from December to March. That so you know when they start making lot, you take a gamble, you start making uh, losses, then they take bigger bets and bigger bets to cover the earlier ones. This is in local term what we call as gali lobang tutu lobang, right? This is what happened, and it's JP Morgan. It's a very uh, well-established, very well-known um, financial institution. When they are fine, um, you know, it, it doesn't do well for their reputation. Okay, why do I have this shown in as an example of the what possibly can go wrong, go wrong with artificial intelligence? It's because my past three um, examples are actually all referring to males, right? because I don't want to be accused of, you know, gender bias. So this is an example uh, where um, this is, um, it, start, it, it was a startup. It's a, she's a very well-known person. And at one point, she was the poster girl, poster lady of the startups in the U.S. Um, have you heard of this? Um, Theranos, it's fall, it's now we know it's a fallen unicorn. This uh, lady, Elizabeth Holmes, actually started the company when she was only 19. She was only 19. So, and then she claimed that based on her technology, based on AI technology, she is able to do 30 lab tests on the blood just by a single drop. How wonderful would that be? It is, right? Um, besides me, anybody here, you know, have the same fear when blood is like being sucked out of you. Right? <laughs> everybody, I think almost everybody lah. Um, and you know like when you do the blood test, right, they take like one, one vial after another. And I always ask when the, you know, my doctor start putting the vial in the tray, hey, how many, how much blood are you going to suck out of me? Okay, this lady, she actually, she claimed can do this one step. Just a prick, the company is able to do a very comprehensive blood test, and at one point, at the height of uh, their their valuation, is valued at ten billion. Ten billion. I also, you know, how many digits are that? Ten billion US dollar. Because she keeps, you know, people want to believe in it, but nobody actually check whether the claim she's making is true or not. 
So people just keep VC sketchy to keep pumping money and all that and she appeared on so many magazines, Fortune, Forbes, this is Inc. magazine, all sorts of magazines. This is happened in 2015, this year. But later towards the year they actually found out that she cannot deliver. There's nothing. She can't do what she promised to deliver. And you know, she was found of fraud, misrepresentation, and you know, in uh, earlier this year. They actually, uh, you know, um, asked her to stand trial in 2020. So she now becomes a, a criminal. Yeah, this is what happened. These are the examples, and then I think you, if you, if you look up, if you look at, there are so many other examples just to give you a flavor. What can go wrong if you don't control this AI and machine learning stuff, right? So how do you stop this from happening? Best practice, I always say, is start from internally, from your own companies, for your own organizations. Okay, I'm going to share with you in the next two slides of my practical experiences, the things that I actually do at Maybank. And I think by the end of the presentation, I will assure you, don't worry, your, bank, your money is safe at Maybank. Because <laughs> me, my colleague there, Michael, and the whole team is making working very, very hard to make sure that you know everything is taken care of. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let's let's go back to the process. Start from the very beginning. We talk about what a model is. Remember the three components: the input, the processing, as well as the output. So where does the model risk comes from? Okay, so we can generally divide it into two components. First of all, the model itself can be defective. There can be something wrong with the model. And the second part is misuse of the model. Okay, let me talk about the second part first like, because uh, I think most of you here at one point or another are actually the user of the model. Um, remember yesterday talking about one of the speakers talked about breeds from iProperty and all that, right? Okay, so we are the we are the users. We are the users. So um, okay, again, this is you know um, talking from you know if you are an organization, you have a team developing the model and you undergo through all these governance processes. And okay, so validator and you know people like me, you give the chance. Okay, the model is good to go. But the second question is, is it being used correctly? Because when you deploy it, you deploy it to so many users. And sometimes people don't understand. Some pe sometimes people try to game it. So it's very important also that for your process, for your controls, not only to cover the dev development as well as the implementation part, but it should go and cover all the all the way up to the model users. Yeah? Okay, so that's the practical side of it. Now coming back, defective model. Let, let me give you a flavor um, how what can go wrong when you develop a model. Okay, so for instance, um, going back to what I mentioned just now, you want to develop a model to see whether you know somebody that come for us for um, a car loan from a bank, say for instance, that whether this person is going to pay or not, right? Uh, anybody, you know, okay, hands up who has hand, uh, who has car loan with uh, Maybank or Maybank Finance? Okay, good. A lot more marketing can be done here. <laughs> Um, okay, so okay, anyway, so before the salespeople come and do the marketing, they will turn to the models to say which target group should I uh, target. Um, so, so here the, the developers they will take in all the historical model, historical data that Maybank has in terms of this auto loan, uh, auto loan um, borrowers, and what we are trying to predict is what we call the. Customers who doesn't pay, default. We call it default. So okay, please bear with me. Is I use default? Default means that uh, the customers who doesn't, who does not pay back the loan as they should be. So we and then when you do the modeling, you will take the data and you will try to look at factors which actually contribute and can predict whether these customers is going to pay or not. So. Um, before talking about big data, let's talk about some simple data, right? So when you give out the loan, the bank will have your age, 
your occupation, your address, your income. Uh, you know that when you, the, the, the normal thing that you do when you pick up when you fill up the loan application form. So, for instance, oh, when the developers take a look at the factors, what we call a single factor analysis, whether it's predictive or not, they may look at there is occupation. They can be that can be predictive, and then when they look at it, and they may see that when you you know when you divide the occupation um, status and uh, the occupation type, you know, it can be. Uh, banker, it can be manager, it can be um, executives and all that, and it can be like there's one group that's called student, right? Any student here? Okay, so um, so based on your logic, do you think that student pose a higher or a lower risk compared to other occupation group? Student higher again? Okay? Because they don't really get, uh, they don't really get steady income. But when this developer just look at the model, they may see that student has very low or no default rate at all, and they will go and make the assumption without the domain knowledge. They will go and make the assumption students are good. So what happened? You know the salespeople will go and do a campaign to target the students. But if oh, you give me five minutes. I get so much, so many things to talk about. <laughs> but but students. But the fact is that the this developer may not know if it's new. Is that at the front end already? We already done the sieving. We already done the sieving that you only take in students if it's backed by parents or if it's already backed by parents. So so this is what happened. Is what I'm trying to say. If you do not know the domain knowledge, if you do not know end to end, you might give wrong example, wrong decision to the decision makers, to the campaign managers, and all that. And then you know you can imagine what happened like, if you use that information actually to to make the decision and to run the campaigns. Okay. I only have five minutes. I didn't realize you know I'm having so much fun out here. Okay, so this is an overview of model risk management. Um, you have to look at it from the cradle when the model is being so-called born up until its retirement. Okay, so I'm going to skip this, but what I wanted to share with you is this is what happened at the organizations. Um, you know, like Maybank, where we have very strict control in terms of model governance. We have not two, not three, but four lines of defense. Okay, we have the first line is actually the model developer team, okay, who actually develop the model and implement it. Then we have second line of defense are people like me who's doing the validation and also the governance, which means that for important models, for material models, the validation team actually perform thorough validation we may replicate it, run the codes again, or we even build a what we call challenger model to see whether what is developed by the developer is actually the best model that you can get. Okay, so that's the second line of defense. I'm the second line of defense. But we provide the assurances that whatever is being done at the first line is actually all in order. And of course that we have the third line of defense which are the external auditor. Sorry, internal auditor lah, internal auditor. Any internal auditor here? Tak ada really. Okay. Uh, but they also need to understand this. They don't do the replication, but they need to make sure that the processes and the policies are actually followed through. And on the, on the at the higher level, at the management level, they also have a, they need to have an overview and provide guidance in terms of the governance, the policies, and all that. Okay. So these four, four lines of defense in uh, organizations such as Maybank. Uh, oh, I forgot. That's another layer. Bank Negara. All this comes under very thorough by Negara scrutiny. They have a specialist team that looks at models and everything related to models and they are very knowledgeable people, very thorough. Okay, I'm saying that this is what's happening at my organization. Uh, some of you from um, you know, non-financial area and also um, from uh, the startups and all that, you, you may, may think this is too much. But think about it and see how it can be applied to your organization before it, you know, without it being um, too restrictive, lah. Okay.
I have quite a lot of slides to go through, but I think I have like what, three minutes? One minute. <laughs> okay, I think they can share this with me if it's just one minute. Um, how do I go to the end? Okay, okay. So, uh, this is talking about what also can go wrong when do you need to take care about the big data? When talk about big data, is even more important to make sure the data that you use is actually um, is clean, is correct, and it's reflective. Because what happened in Amazon is they wanted to automate hiring process. I'm okay. I'm sure all of us here has attended interviews. Uh, some of us may be more frequent than others. But I'm also sure that some of us here have actually sat on the other side of the interview table, the interviewers, right? So, you know, it's not easy to um, gauge the right candidate. So what Amazon is trying to do here is to automate this hiring process. But what happened was they got it wrong because the data that is fed into the AI model is actually um, it's more skewed to, towards male candidates because of the population is of more male so they tend to put, uh, penalize female so but anyway good thing that they discovered about one year of use and they scrape the models facebook cambridge analytica very fresh in the mind uh, unprecedented penalty of five billion right this is what can go wrong um, Okay, this is very briefly, that the repercussion, if AI or model fail, the repercussion is not just what I mentioned just now based on the individual companies, the whole economy, the world economy can collapse. And this is what happened in 2008. This is subprime crisis in the US. Again, this is a model failure because they are looking at subprime. It's very high risk group of borrowers, but they package it in such a way. They call it uh, CDS, right? The CDS and um, you know the, um, then the package is as good loans and backed by the insurance company. When it fell through, the whole world collapsed. Okay. Will it happen in Malaysia? I think probably not the same kind of crisis because the good thing is because we are not that sophisticated in using the financial instrument. So that's why we, we, the Asian countries were spared when, you know, when that happened in the US and Europe. But again, this is lesson to be learned. And because of that, various um, countries actually come up with the regulations in terms of how these financial models should be controlled. And especially now with the coming out of AI, ML, and ML, various countries have actually issued the guidance. And closer to home is, you know, Singapore actually has issued the uh, some guidance, it's not um, descriptive, but more prescriptive on how actually um, this uh, big data and the new areas can, uh, should be managed. Okay, I've come to the end. Don't worry, Serena. One minute, one minute. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry to paint such a gloomy picture on this beautiful morning. You know, today when I... Uh, Drive here, it looks like very blue sky, right? After a few weeks of dark skies. So it's blue. Our the future is blue for all of you sitting here, right? Okay, data scientist. Sexiest job of the 21st century. Okay? From Howard, this is from Howard Business Review. So no doubt about it, the future is very bright for all of you who's interested in data science in this room. Very, very bright. Just make sure what I mentioned just now, you take that into account when you know when you are doing your coding, your algorithm, and in your you know, and your um, deployment of the of the models that you have developed. Okay, I end with this. Dr. Sheldon Cooper, my favorite TV character. <laughs> okay, what is his occupation? in the Big Bang Theory. It just ended after 12 years of run. Anybody knows what is his uh, occupation? Physicist, yes. Not only physicist, you know. Theoretical physicist. Very, very smart guy. And in the, in, in the series, that is, um, that is his occupation because it started way back in year 2007. But I'm sure if it started more time, you would have been a data scientist. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. I have never seen anybody have so much fun talking about risk and failure.
You are definitely very good at your job, man.